Ten years ago, I was giving a talk at an engineering robotics conference. Um, I was the token lawyer, uh, and the talk was on uh, AI robotics and law. And at the end of the talk, a uh, hand goes up in the Q&A, and an engineer stands up and says, uh, I don't understand why we need all this law stuff. And really, he meant all these lawyers. Um, and all we have to do is make sure that all of our robots and AIs and all these things um, are programmed with Asimov's three laws of robotics. And I won't ask how many people here are aware of the three laws of robotics, but I did ask that at this conference, and every hand in the room goes up. Um, a robot may not harm a human being. A robot uh, may not allow harm to come to itself unless it's required in order to spare the human being. Basic ethical considerations for robots, all good. Um, but the question that was being asked was why we needed anything more. And at that time, there wasn't really that much in the way of actual technologies that were out there that one could look at and see what their function was, their purpose was, how they operated, the risks they posed, the benefits they gave, gave us. Um, and so in those circumstances, it was going to be hard uh, to answer uh, that question from the engineer. Now, fast forward to today, and we're in a very different situation. We are now actually seeing technologies, AI technologies, move from prototype in the lab to uh, actual functions and actual products in society. And as we do that, then the questions of law become much more uh, important and looming and actual. But important to stress, it's because Law can only get actual when the technologies get actual or are very close to being actual. And so we are reaching that point now, and we're reaching a point that's really quite a marvelous position uh, to be in, in which we now have enough actual, real paths of technology that we can talk in real ways about the way in which society should regulate them. And this is an exciting opportunity, the regulation of actual uh, technologies. Um, and in many ways, this is going to be something that enables these technologies. So there are enormous opportunities here. We have to be sure that we um, take clear awareness of the various kinds of risks that are posed and the harms that are posed. But this is what law, regulation, and technology have always done. So in the middle of this exciting conversation, um, we now find that there's kind of an, extru an extrusion from the outside, which is that certain prominent scientists and technologists are telling us that we, yes, need to regulate AI, but we need to regulate artificial intelligence technologies for a very different reason, not for reasons about the risks posed today are within the immediately visible path of technology, but because we have to be worried that at some point in the future, these AI technologies may become progressively smarter and smarter to the point that they escape human control, uh, transcend their human programming, pose an existential threat to humanity, and ravage us. Yeah. Um, this would be not so important were we not beginning the conversation about actual regulation of actual technology now. And I suggest that this is uh, an extraordinarily bad uh, idea in public policy and regulation, uh, and that it threatens to hijack this conversation that we desperately need to have about actual technologies today. In fact, I would go one step further and say that we need to aggressively push back against uh, this kind of voice at the moment that the real uh, regulation is most important. Need to push back against that, um, in large part by just saying these things are not risks. There are existential risks to humanity. Um, nuclear war, possibility of a bioengineered uh, pathogen uh, that could you know, go out and do terrible, terrible things. But these have some basis in actual technologies, even if they haven't, in fact, been realized. 
when we talk about the superintelligence that's going to be too smart for us and ravage us, we're talking about something completely different that's in the realm of imagination. And I don't think that a bare logical possibility in a possible world, as the philosophers might say, constitutes a risk. And it's certainly not a risk that analysis of the kind that law, regulation, and public policy can or should uh, even take into account. And that's in large part because we have plenty of risks that need to be taken into account for the technologies that we are actually seeing emerge now and can foresee very quickly coming uh, into being. But one of the questions that arises is, why does this happen with AI technologies? I mean, in other words, why are some of the most eminent voices in the field, technologists, you know, great minds in the field, why do they suddenly flip into this kind of AI apocalypse mode based around kind of imaginary possibilities? We don't do this with other technologies. Nobody does this with toasters. Nobody does it with toasters that are connected to the Internet of Things. Whoa. What is it about AI that winds up eliciting these kinds of responses? And let me just call this AI enchantment. The technology has this capability of enchanting the inventors, enchanting users, and let's be clear, has the capacity to enchant the legal regulator type people, the lawyers, the government regulators, judges, and legislators as well. And by enchant, I mean that it winds up leading to distorted perspectives, distorted perceptions, and distorted expectations about what the technology is, what its capabilities and limitations are, and winds up distorting the ways in which we think about it. And this can happen in two different directions. It can distort us into kind of the dystopian versions that are preferred by uh, Hollywood. Um, the AI apocalypse, uh, apocalyptic AI, um, but it can also be distorted in the other direction, in the sort of utopian direction, into kind of fantasies that these technologies will um, produce a sort of utopia in which we are all warm and happy, all of our material needs are solved, and we can just devote ourselves to mindfulness. And, um, these are exaggerations of various kinds, and the question is, what brings them about? How do they arise? And I want to suggest it's because AI is special among technologies in the way in which it tends to destabilize mental categories we have that we use to structure our world. And in destabilizing them, suddenly the idea that there are sort of fixed limits and possibilities winds up getting all fuzzed up as well and blurred. One of these lines that AI is particularly um, addressed to is the difference between creatures and things. And in destabilizing that line along with the line of machine execution, execution of its programming on the one hand and human consciousness, intentionality, purpose, and will uh, on the other, those lines get blurred, which artificial intelligence, almost the very terminology, invites us to do. The result of that can wind up being that we um, suddenly have an explosion of mental possibilities of things that no longer seem to have limits to us, not confined, which can be a great thing, until we try to enact that into law. Mm -hmm. But in this process of an explosion of possibilities, it leads to exaggerations that push out to these extremes, the uh, AI apocalypse on the one hand and angelic AI, as we might call the utopian possibility on the other. I think they're both mistakes. But now, particularly the technologists in the audience are thinking to themselves, yeah, but I do not suffer from sci-fi AI enchantment, you know? I mean, I stick to my knitting and do stuff. I'm, I'm not under this enchantment. I want to suggest, however, that this is too quick a conclusion because there are ways in which you can have a form of AI enchantment dealing with very ordinary applications of the technologies that are in front of us today and are emerging in the foreseeable paths of technology now. It doesn't require any sci-fi possibilities. And there are a number of ways in which that can arise, but the one I want to pinpoint today is 
One that I think goes overlooked in part, uh, at least in the world beyond the technologists themselves. And this is the fact that the language that we use to express human action turns out to be exactly the same words we use to describe machine actions. So we say, we're human beings, she decides to, hmm. When we say decides in that case, we are talking about decide as a word that is bound up and connected to all of human purposiveness. She decides because she has intentions, because she uh, has purpose, because she has will. We use the same word when we talk about the computer deciding to take an action as it executes its programming. If you, and, and that's perfectly okay, so long as one bears in mind that we don't actually mean quite the same thing, and I don't know what alternative language we'd come up with. It's very difficult to think of a whole new set of words that would describe what the machine is doing. So we use the same words for both, but insofar as those two get confused, conflated, and mixed up, it invites very, very distorted perceptions of what the technology might be. You know, technologists, in my experience, are actually very attentive to this problem and don't tend to fall into it, but I do not think that the ordinary world is going to be able to maintain some strict distance between these and differentiation. And I can assure you that lawyers, government regulators, uh, judges, and legislators will not be able to maintain any kind of distance like that, at least not if they are not educated and made aware of the possibilities uh, in order to sort of separate out what's machine and what's misplaced expectations imported into uh, AI technologies because we've pulled in a certain set of human concepts. Now, law has a role to play in just regulation. If you play in society, you gotta play by society's rules. But with respect to this enchantment, Law can have a role in helping to disenchant, uh, sorry, to de-enchant, uh, to de-enchant AI and to sort of take down some of this enchantment that threatens to distort and give us misperceptions. And it does so primarily by two mechanisms. One is that the law, which has been dealing with new technologies for a long time, looks at AI technologies as they come online and says, we're gonna put them into existing legal categories. And the legal categories we have out there reflect long-standing human concerns that are not gonna go away. Human values that we have, so safety is one, but it's also equality and justice and fairness and these other qualities that are reflected in categories of law. And those are not gonna get tossed out the window on account of some AI technology, but they have the effect of sort of grounding the technology and giving it a sense of limits that are contained within human purposes. The second way in which law can help de-enchant AI is by, call it siloing. We will tend to regulate particular AI technologies according to the function they play and the existing laws and the existing regulations and the existing regulators. Self-driving car technologies will be regulated by the Department of Transportation, the National Highway Safety Transportation Board, Transportation Safety Board. Um, and stuff related to privacy, stuff related to the use of facial recognition software. Uh, predictive analytics and sentencing behavior for um, criminals. All of these different kinds of things will tend to be regulated by whoever deals with that kind of stuff already. And the effect of that is to break down the kind of illusion associated, the enchantment associated with artificial intelligence considered as a single category all by itself. We break it down into discrete and much more human-oriented um, forms of uh, technology and regulation. Now, there is, however, a risk, of course, that law itself can become enchanted and that all these 
people that are part of the legal players, the legal actors, can become enchanted. And I think without uh, concerted awareness and education to become aware, yeah, I think they will be enchanted and they will have very distorted impressions about what the technology is, what it's capable of, what its limitations are. There are two basic defenses against this kind of um, enchantment of law. One of them uh, is that simply the people involved in this have got to be very sophisticated about the technology itself. And I don't mean at the level of the computer scientists and engineers, but I do mean in ways to be able to ask sophisticated questions that show an awareness of the distinct areas of AI, machine learning, and so on and so on, at a level that will help them to ask the questions about these things from the standpoint of our human intended uses of the technology. And that's the perspective that the regulators should have. They have to be able to translate that into something that's um, uh, concrete. The second way in which we wind up getting past um, this risk of enchantment is important because it says we will de-enchant because we will insist that we treat AI technologies not as anything which is kind of outside or beyond human experience or anything even outside of human beings, but that it's just another tool like any technology that human beings have invented ever. And if we see AI technologies as just another human tool, this again will tend to ground them in the question of how good are they at carrying out the things we care about as human beings. And to the extent that law and regulation is able to make that kind of question concrete, how good is it as a tool, then we will be asking about the effectiveness of that tool and ways in which it can be bettered. We will not be sitting around worrying about technology getting, AI technology getting progressively smarter and smarter and smarter uh, until it ravages us, ravages us. So the question that's going to arise for AI, AI is never going to be, is the technology too smart? The problem is never going to be that the technology is too smart. It will always be that it's too stupid. Okay. Too stupid in the sense that it's a human tool and that's what we need it and use it for. That means then that if we don't get past the enchantment of AI, then we run the risk of thinking the problem is that it's too smart. And if we frame it that way as a question of risks of being too smart that we must regulate against, then we're going to wind up producing bad law for good technology. If, on the other hand, we get past the AI enchantment, we do get past it, then in that case we will be able to focus on the question of the AI as a tool which we can make better, and we will understand then that we can have better technology through better law. Thank you.